G'day folks and welcome to this overview and example of play of Kingdom Death Monster. If I were forced to choose just one game to take to a desert island, it would be this. If my house were on fire and I could only rescue one game, it would be this. Now a game of Kingdom Death Monster begins with you lifting this massive box onto the table, this very heavy box, and very carefully lifting off the lid. Inside, your gloriously detailed miniatures that you may have spent hours putting together and painting sit waiting for their next adventure. The hundreds of cards and tokens for the thick and, and lavishly illustrated rulebook combine to fill the spaces. You set the board on the table and carefully, methodically organise the components around the edges. Now some people are drawn by the breadth and the quality of those components. There is just so much happening here, or at least so much to potentially happen down the track. And one thing to keep in mind is that I have a few expansions for this. So this, this is uh, more than what you get in the base game, but you do certainly get hundreds of cards in the base game. Your friends sit around the table with their survivor record sheets. They think for a moment, then they proudly name their survivors. And of course, there's always that one friend who has to screw with them. Gatorade, really? You're calling your character Gatorade? Okay, whatever. All these survivors gain a survival point and prepare for what is about to unfold. You carefully place the white line in the center of the table. It is huge, it's menacing, it's awesome. Now, some people love the quality of those miniatures. They're a work of art, and you can spend a lot of time just admiring the detail and, again, painting these. You and your friends place your characters on the board near the line. Combat is about to begin. The tension and the excitement are palpable. Now, the white line activates first, and you draw an AI card, Claw. The line picks a target. It's Gatorade. It rushes in, adjacent to Gatorade, and attacks with the speed of two, meaning it rolls two dice. It scores two hits, and, well, anything on a one on a D10 hits. So that's virtually guaranteed. These monsters are very aggressive. The monster rolls two dice to determine the hit locations on Gatorade, and <laughs> Gatorade takes a blow to the legs and one to the torso. It serves him right for picking an annoying name. Now it's our turn, and this is where it starts. Now Gatorade wants to go first and strike back at the line, so he rolls two dice, ending a seven or more to hit, a three and an eight, so one hit. Gatorade draws a top card from the hit location deck. His attack has targeted the line's strange hand. Now the line has a toughness of six, and Gatorade is using his founding stone, which gives him plus one strength. And this effectively reduces the target's toughness, which means he'll hit on a five or more. He rolls and it's a two, a miss, a failure. The hit location card indicates that the monster responds to failures. It instinctively strikes back with its basic attack. So it rolls two dice and both hit again. These lines never seem to roll a one. The locations are arm and torso. So he's wounded, but alive for now. Alara goes next. They move behind the line to get into the blind spot, which makes it easy to hit. And then they roll two dice, but two misses. Ugh. Glarg next, and they also move behind the line to get in its weak spot or blind spot. They roll two dice to hit and two hits. Now Glarg draws two hit locations from the deck. Glorious main and soft belly, and it'd be really nice to get a critical hit on either of those for the bonuses. Now, Glad decides to target the main first. If he gets a critical hit, a 10, or what's called a lantern result, he gets a bonus resource card to take home. Now we all lean closer to see the roll, and it's an 8. That would normally cause a wound, but unfortunately, this location is impervious and can't be wounded, so no damage is done. No matter, he can still wound the other target, the soft belly. He rolls again and it's a three, so no effect. Well, at least the line doesn't respond to this attack. The next character, Breg, goes next. They move to attack the line side on, and they roll a three and an eight, so one hit. A Breg draws a hit location card and finds they've struck the line on its maw. Breg rolls to wound, and it's a two, so no effect, but the line again responds to failure on this hit location. They roar triumphantly. Breg rolls to check the effect, Rolls a six, and as a result, suffers one brain damage, and he's knocked down. Uh, well, the brain damage causes a, a light injury to his brain. Now the line takes another turn. We flip the next AI card and find terrifying roar. Wow, this guy likes to roar, I guess. Glarg rolls a four, and Brig rolls a six. Now both Glarg and Brig suffer one brain damage and are knocked back six spaces. Glarg notes a light injury to his brain, Brig, however, already has a light injury, so he has to roll on what's called the Serious Injury Table. He rolls a two. This result is Mortal Terror. No ifs, ends, or buts. The survivor is dead. 
Well, Brett had, Brett had fun playing the game. He got one attack in and scored one hit. You can just watch the rest of the action from the side. Okay, our turn again. Gatorade roars back at the line. Damn you, beast, you killed my... Well, he wasn't quite my friend. I just met him in this dark room. But you killed... What was his name again? Bren? Berg? Bregg? Gatorade decides to attack the monster face on. It's never a good decision, but neither was naming himself Gatorade. Uh, the result is one miss, one hit. Gatorade draws a hit location. Beast's elbow. Gatorade rolls to wound and misses. And it's another failure response. The beast moves forward in a straight line, grabbing anyone it passes over. Well, he grabs Gatorade, drags him for a few spaces, and throws him to the ground. He's knocked down. Gatorade suffers one damage per monster level, which is just level one for this line. So it's one dice, and of course, it's a head. Gatorade rolls on the serious injury table. A three. The result, decapitation, you are dead. Gatorade at least got two attacks in. Uh, that's one more than Bregg, and so Gatorade joins Bregg on the side, left to watch the remaining survivors. At this stage, a few minutes into gameplay, of the very first encounter, the prologue, half of the survivors are dead, and the lion isn't even wounded yet. There's a long way to go in what is looking like an inevitable defeat. So how does this feel? Well, this is just an example of how the game might play out. Of course, every game, every battle plays out differently, and there are so many wonderful ways to suffer and die. Now, for example, in one encounter I had, a survivor suffered multiple serious injuries to his body, causing him to bleed out slowly and die. In another encounter, a survivor was rendered mostly useless by suffering a destroyed back from a monster attack. Your survivors will miss rolls, they will fail to wound, they suffer counterattacks, they suffer damage, they suffer serious, debilitating, sometimes deadly injuries, they bleed, they suffer permanent disabilities that impair their ability to move, attack and defend. And then they might die quite suddenly and unexpectedly. There is so much darkness and despair in this game. Now, some people love the idea that every attack, every roll could be their last or could be the last for the monster. What begins as a tactical attempt to stab the lion in its vulnerable rump could very easily result in a trap, meaning the lion turns around, attacks you, hits your head, causes a serious injury, and kills you instantly. Some people don't mind that their characters die, because for the rest of the game they can just watch their friends, cheer them along, and hope, don't be foolish, that nothing too bad happens to the others in that group. Some people love the tension of rolling on those serious injury tables, hoping not to get a one, having everyone lean over to see the result the moment the die stops spinning, and oh, you know, very well ahead of time, not to roll low on those tables. Some people like the excitement of rolling for a cool critical hit, like when you score a critical hit on the lion's maw, which cleaves the jaw from the lion's face and sends it flying across the floor. Or when you score a critical hit on the lion's gut, which means the vo lion vomits all over you. Or of course, a critical hit to the lion's groin, we destroy the lion's genitals. Then again, some people find the difficulty of success and the penalty for failure really frustrating. You can often get through an entire encounter without scoring a single critical wound. You go through some rounds of combat without even scoring a hit on the monster. Breaking this down, the success or survival of your character is often determined by a few key dice rolls at critical moments. If you get hit in the head twice during an encounter, there's a 40% chance your character will then die instantly. If you draw a few bad AI cards, you could just die instantly. If you play carefully, tactically, utilizing your weapons for critical hits and keeping your wounded characters out of harm's way, you could just get a bad AI card or hit location result and die instantly anyway. In many of those circumstances, there's nothing you can do about it. You just die. And once things start to go bad, they snowball. Generally, only standing survivors are threats to these monsters. So survivors that are knocked down and can't activate are not threats. So the monsters will typically target those survivors that are actually able to do something, typically the closest survivor, and in many cases the only survivor who is in range to attack the enemy. There's a good chance they'll be knocked down too, which further harms your cause. And when one survivor dies, the monster just focuses on the remaining three. You now have one quarter less hitting power. And then, once everything goes wrong and everyone dies, well, that's it. If the survivors all, survive, all die in the prologue, you start all over again. You set up the prologue and start from scratch. In time, you might develop small tactics and plans to deal with specific monsters. You discover weaknesses, and so you plan to exploit these with certain weapons. You uncover dangers, so plan to avoid those. And then the plans come undone, and you just die anyway. Okay, now let's take a step back. If... If you survive the prologue, you join with other survivors to form part of the population within a new settlement. And that's where you begin to appreciate the broader scope 
of Kingdom Death Monster. You realise then that Gatorade really doesn't matter all that much. The character, not the beverage. He was just one member of this, this larger population, which starts somewhere between 10 and 14 people. And sure, the death of Bregg hurt, but there are others to take his place. Now, because you and your friends don't necessarily own a particular character, you represent various characters within that population. For each encounter beyond the first, you select what character to take out on the hunt. And it can, and often is, a different character each time, depending on what you're trying to do and who you want to have experience the encounter. You might take a strong and evasive veteran to do some damage to the monster, or taking some rookies to kind of harden them to battle. One of the most important elements in this is the material you take into the battle. For the prologue, each of your characters just has a piece of cloth tied as armour around their waist and a piece of founding stone which they use as a weapon, like a little dagger. If you defeat the lion, to be fair, despite the disaster described earlier, chances are generally in your favour for that first encounter. If you win, then after the battle you, you rip into that lion carcass and extract whatever resources you can. This is a combination of bone, hide, organs and the occasional other random piece of resource. When you return to camp, when you get to your settlement, you use those resources to craft new equipment such as new weapons, armour and special items. You can even use resources to innovate your society, develop new knowledge which again allows you to build and do more in these settlements. When you next set out to hunt for your next adventure, you'll be slightly better prepared. Your raw hide headband crafted from the lion's hide might block one damage to the head. Oh, if only Gatorade had one of those. He might still be... Nah, he probably would have been eaten anyway. Your bone blade crafted from the lion's bones makes it easier to wound the target and so on. Each encounter you have allows you to bring back more and better resources and gradually you craft better items in better settlement locations and by better characters and you'll need them because the monsters get stronger. Some people like that settlement phase most out of all the game's elements. They love the idea of building up a society, innovating, developing weapons and armour and equipping those characters suited for particular roles in combat. In time, you might identify a tank character who can sustain damage, a ranged character who excels with the bow, and perhaps a general healing character who is there to help the others, like a support. They'll develop particular skills and some disabilities, perhaps, that define their role even further. It might limit them in certain ways, but strengthen them in others, until, of course, they inevitably die. It can be satisfying to survive through that darkness and despair and actually achieve those small things for those characters until they die. Gradually, the monsters get harder and you may struggle to develop armour and weapons strong enough to defeat them. Your people start dying more frequently, they face adverse events and you struggle to maintain healthy characters. Everyone's wounded uh, and so forth. Your population might start to decline slowly, slowly, slowly until they're all gone and your settlement is wiped out. And if your therapist thinks it's okay to do so, you can start the campaign anew. Now, some people like the idea of being able to or, or having to start all over again and begin that story campaign anew. And technically, there are remnants of your previous settlement left behind in that world. Some people say, God damn it, why? I, I miss Gatorina, which is a female version of Gatorade who featured in a subsequent campaign and became really strong, brave, evasive, and generally awesome. Why did she have to die? Now, let's take one final step back from this. How you respond to the failure of your settlement, more so than the loss of a character or the loss of an encounter, and the need to restart the campaign is a core factor in whether or not you'll like and have time for Kingdom Death Monster. Some days you want to start all over again and get straight back into that line and build up a new settlement. Other days, really, you never want to play the bloody game again. It's so depressing and frustrating and annoying and people just die randomly and why would they ever play this game? Why? Because you want to get that awesome armour collection that you didn't get last time, kill that elusive monster and win the campaign. Maybe this time you pursue a different settlement philosophy or try different weapon armour combinations and tactics. Maybe you figured out a new way to approach that monster's weakness or a better way to avoid its dangers. And so, after perhaps 26, 30 hours of playing that last campaign, you get over that loss of that last settlement and set it up all over again. That is Kingdom Death Monster.